Hi, welcome to another show, another live stream by the Global Network, our show called Space Alert. Uh, the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space was created in 1992 to try to prevent a new arms race in space. You can help us uh, uh, get this circulated more by clicking on the like button and subscribing to our YouTube channel. And visit our website, if you can, at spaceforpeace.org, spaceforpeace.org. Our guest this time is Dr. Dave Webb from Leeds, England. Dave is a, a, uh, the board convener of the Global Network, and he's also our webmaster. Does a great job there. We want to thank uh, Global Network board member Will Griffin in Philadelphia for doing all the tech work on this show. So, Dave, welcome to the show. Uh, please tell us a bit more about yourself, your background and such. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, I was, uh, I, I did a, a PhD in space physics, um, which I, um, I got in 1975. Uh, seems, well, it is years ago now. Uh, then a couple of postdocs and so on. Um, and at the time, I wasn't particularly politically active or anything. So I got a job with the Ministry of Defence here in the UK. Uh, and uh, the job was to monitor the Soviet space um, situation, what they were doing in space. And uh, I soon got to realise that what we were doing, in fact, was producing a worse possible case for then the government uh, and the Ministry of Defence here to, re to react to that worst possible case, even if it wasn't really actually happening. We saw the same kind of situation in Iraq and all the other places that have uh, been invaded by NATO and so on. Um, so then I left pretty soon. I wasn't there for very long and, and I joined CND, which was pretty big campaign for nuclear disarmament. It was a huge uh, campaign at the time, nuclear weapons were a big thing. Uh, so I joined that local group and then gradually joined the uh, the Yorkshire region group, became chair of that, and eventually became chair of the national CND from about 2010 to 2021, where, so last year, I stood down as chair mainly to get more involved, I think, in the space work, because this is becoming increasingly more important. Um, and I think I joined the Global Network around 1998 or so, something like that, a few years after you'd started already. But uh, the first, my first journey was to Colorado Springs, to the belly of the beast, as, uh, as it said. And um, that was a real eye-opener to see what's going on there and to see the, pe the people resisting it, even though they live in the middle of the whole thing. So I've been inspired by the work of people in the Global Network for many years now. Well, you certainly are a key, 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 key uh, person uh, times a thousand for us. And we're really grateful for all you do. There seems to be a big increase in the use of space these days with the military, various commercial companies, and now space tourists all joining into the gold rush to space. What are the major problems that you see with this increase in activity? Well, I think uh, the more space launches uh, means more problems with environmental damage, with debris, with pollution, effects on the upper atmosphere of the Earth, and so on. And, and there's more launch accidents, too. There's always a possibility of an accident at, at launch. And as different corporations are competing for this trillion-dollar market uh, place, trying to get up one up on their competitors, and take more risks, more problems are likely to happen. So um, a more space activity means more space debris and collisions between satellites have been occurring and a cascade of collisions where collisions lead to other collisions and so on could bring about this so-called Kessler syndrome, leaving so much debris around there in the uh, 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 orbiting the Earth that we'll never be able to escape through it. We won't be able to maneuver a spacecraft through it. So we could be trapped on the Earth. 
And also these mega constellations are not yet fully populated, but they're already causing problems because their trails are showing up in uh, astronomers' photographs um, and they are calling for more regulation on allocating astronomers, that is uh, allocating orbital slots. So for example, Starlink already has licenses to operate, I think over 12,000 satellites with another 30,000 which may follow and with others that could lead to over 55,000 satellites orbiting the Earth. And uh, Scarlet uses three different altitudes um, to, um, to put their, their satellites into position. And some of them are very low, or low Earth orbits, just a few hundred miles above the Earth. And at these low altitudes, satellites don't last forever, maybe five to ten years, because they're subject to atmospheric drag. So the low Earth orbit, LEO as it's called, is it's also called the graveyard orbital area. And satellites are often moved there in order for their orbits to decay. And then they burn up in the atmosphere. And the population of the lower Earth orbit has already increased by 50% in the last few years. And I think people have shown that when these things come through the atmosphere and burn up, they deposit tons of um, pollution into the atmosphere, including uh, the, a, lot of, a lot of the material is aluminium, and the burning of aluminium produces aluminium oxide, which is known as alumina, which has a significant potential to change the chemistry of the upper atmosphere. So there's big problems um, for the atmosphere with these continuous burn-ups of, of satellites. Just, just one other thing. Uh, NASA, I think, is intending to deorbit the International Space Station in 2031, and it's arranging for it to come down in the South Pacific Ocean. They'll use uh, probably Russian and US spacecraft to push it into the right orbit for, for it to break up in the atmosphere. They'll break up into such large pieces, it won't be able to all burn up in the atmosphere as it comes down. So it'll come down in this place called Point Nemo in the Pacific Ocean between Antarctica, New Zealand and Argentina. And uh, it's supposed to be the furthest place from any human civilization, but it's already being used as a, a graveyard for spacecraft. I think it's got something between 250 to 300 spacecraft in it already wow. uh, deep in the ocean. So, um, uh, oh, and one final thing, uh, there is more talk now of nuclear powered spacecraft, which is worrying because um, they want to go to Mars with these things and set up nuclear uh, power stations there and so on, on the moon as well. But if one of those were to go wrong at launch, we'd be in real trouble, I think. Uh, these um, thousands and tens of thousands of satellites done, mm -hmm. launched by SpaceX and other companies, these are mostly for 5G, is that correct? I think now they are, yeah, they're becoming more used for 5G. And they, they have these very low orbits in order to make the speed of communication very quick, uh, or rather the time uh, that it takes for the communications to be very fast. So they're exploiting the lower orbits and saying this will give you extremely fast 5G broadband. So I and guess the idea is that every single person on the Earth every minute of the day, if you can imagine, would have a 5G satellite over their head so that they could uh, get a signal. Uh, yeah. that's, that's a lot of launches. And as you were talking about this crowding of orbits and increasing Kessler syndrome where things are crashing into each other, it's a frightening possibility. Absolutely. Let me ask you, could you say just a bit more about the effects of space launches themselves? Right here in Maine, uh, there is a bill pending in our state legislature to create uh, a launch authority and maybe have one or two uh, launch facilities in our state. And uh, so we're starting to organize around that now. So more, a little bit more on the environmental impacts of space launches would be uh, useful. Sure. Yeah, well... I mean, during the launch process, rockets are burning uh, through a huge amount of fuel and they're at um, 
uh, there are a range of different propellants that are being used. Many rockets use a mixture of kerosene and liquid oxygen, while others use liquid hydrogen or some other more complex compounds. Some propellants consist of two components, um, a fuel and an oxidizer that spontaneously ignite when they come into contact. One of these is called UDMH, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, and uh, TCO, nitrogen tetroxide. This has been called, or UDMH, has been called devil's venom by Soviet scientists, and a UN development program review in 2020 reported that it caused severe environmental damage to a huge area around the Balkanor Cosmodrome launch uh, site in Kazakhstan. It, it's highly carcinogenic and emitted by Russia's proton rockets. Very little research has been published on it, but according to the UN, UDMH and byproducts can stay in the soil for decades. Russia doesn't use this anymore, but U UDMH is used by China for their Long March rockets, which are still uh, uh, servicing their space station. Um, NASA has a mixture of aluminium and ammonia to launch the space shuttles, and following several sh shuttle launches, large numbers of fish were found dead in nearby waters and investigations showed that the space shuttle emissions may temporarily have made the water slightly acidic. Uh, it recovers, but uh, it didn't recover enough for the fish to, to survive. You know, I lived in Florida for 30 years and uh, I lived close for 20 years. I lived very close to the, uh, Space Center in Florida. And almost after every launch, uh, there were reports by the local Sierra Club and others that there were significant bird and fish kills because the launch center is right in the middle of a wildlife refuge. Uh, they, they did that to make it look all very benign and safe, right? But the truth is that every time they launched, they were killing uh, wildlife. Um, are there any legal constraints on the space uses to protect the environment? Any regulations at all? Uh, you know, currently the global network is part of two different legal actions before the federal government, uh, the FCC, the Federal uh, Communications Commission regulates these launches supposedly. Uh, and so we're part of two lawsuits now uh, demanding more regulation. Uh, but what can you say about uh, where that stands right now? Well, that's a good point. I mean, I don't think there is much. Uh, the, the kind of major treaty, um, which uh, is a basis for space law, really, is the Outer Space Treaty. And that was constructed, put together in 1967, or came into force in 1967. Um, an article, one of that, uh, says that the exploration and use of outer space shall be carried on for the benefit and in the interests of mankind. Um, and a couple of the other articles talk about liability and harmful, avoiding harmful contamination. But these are fairly general statements and they're not aimed at the current situation. Things have developed a heck of a lot since 1967. So the Outer Space Treaty really needs updating or supplementing in some way. A lot has happened since it came into force. Um, I think the core objectives of the United Nations Environmental Programme are to advocate for global environment and help to set the global environmental agenda. But there's nothing concerning measuring, monitoring or controlling the ethics of space flight on, on the environment. There's a lot that needs to be done. A lot, that, a lot of the uh, space law needs to be developed. Uh, the big question is whether you'll get everybody to agree agree to it. You know, it's the same thing as like, arms control, I guess. In order for it to be effective, you've got to have a whole international uh, agreement on it, uh, which may be more difficult these days. That's really our job, isn't it, to do the education work. This is the reason why the global network exists to right. do education work around these space issues to try to build a constituency 
internationally uh, that begins to have an impact on this. So uh, that's why Absolutely. we're that's why we're doing this interview. And uh, right. With well, those I think one thing we could we could say is that you know in 1992 the Rio Earth Summit they they put together or they accepted something called the precautionary principle, which is um, to try to uh, so that the richest few of us will con will uh, will not continue to endanger the survival of the poorest many, and this this principle states that where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. So there's a statement there that's accepted by the Rio Earth Summit that we could use and say, look, we've got to stop putting all this stuff in until we know more about what the effects on the environment are of all these launches, of all these satellites, etc. You know, when they, uh, these launch companies declare they're going to launch these tens of thousands, I've seen numbers up to 80,000 of these mini satellites for 5G, for example. Uh, they increasingly are saying they need more launch facilities, more rocket launch facilities. And so we've, in the last, uh, our last newsletter, we did a, a series of uh, articles about some of these places from Scotland to uh, Indonesia to New Zealand to uh, uh, Michigan now, uh, Georgia. I mean, just all over the place. Uh, these things are being proposed or being built. Um, even as I mentioned earlier, even here, here in my home state of Maine is this proposal to uh, create uh, one or more launch sites. Why do you think this is happening. Uh, is this the real reason these sites are being built because of this growing demand? Because we see many of these places, they say it's going to be for civilian to launch these civilian things, but then it turns out that they that they end up doing military. Can you talk more about that whole general area, please? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, this is one thing I'm trying to um, get across to the people in Scotland. You mentioned uh, there are three sites there that are, going, are wanting to be developed that, uh, of, of spaceports. And all the time they're told, oh, this will be good for jobs, it'll bring money into the local region. You know, they're, they're pretty remote, some of these places. And it's the same arguments that have been brought into other places, like in New Zealand and in Alaska, in, in Kodiak Island. The people there were told, this is all for commercial, you'll get lots of jobs, you'll get lots of money coming in. Um, Kodiak Island, for example, was put out of commission for a couple of years because a launch blew up uh, and uh, put the whole thing out of commission. And since then, I don't think they've had more than a couple of launches. Um, and this is over a period of uh, how many years? Uh, three or four years, I think, uh, or, or maybe two or three years. So um, <clears throat> it doesn't work out as well as people had said. The people in New Zealand are saying, all of the launches they've had, people in Kodiak are saying the same, have been for military purposes, not for commercial purposes. And I think that's one of the reasons why they want so many spaceports, because the military like to diversify these kind of capabilities so they can't all be kind of taken out at once, I guess. And that kind of gives them an opportunity to launch from different places uh, if they need to. So, you know, that's one reason. I think also the uh, the local communities are convinced that this is going to be huge business. As you know, it's being predicted it'll be worth a trillion dollars by 2030. The space business, so, and they've been told by governments and others, you know, you want to get in there, get some, get a slice of this, and, and bring it, in, bring it into your local communities and so on. But that doesn't actually tend to happen. That's what they're saying right now in Maine. That right. oh, yeah, we've got to do this quick because. Uh, the deadline for money from the Pentagon, actually, in the public hearing they had, a guy got up and said that he's got money from the Missile Defense Agency to do testing of missile defense technologies, and they can get another bunch of money if they get the approval on this uh, site in Maine immediately, and he's really pushing it hard. 
Uh, but then the proponent of the bill, the, the state senator from Brunswick, Maine, who is uh, pushing the bill, says, oh, no, 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 well, this is all going to be very civilian, military has nothing to do with it. Uh, it's all going to be biofuels. Uh, what do you know about biofuels, by the way? Uh, uh, there's, there, there is a small startup rocket company here in Maine that says they're going to do their launches with biofuels. Are biofuels benign? I don't think anything's benign that you kind of shove into an into an environment that it, that it's not meant to be in. Uh, if you see what I mean, so uh, there's going to be problems even whatever the fuel that's used. Just by sending these things up through the through the atmosphere, they punch holes through the ozone layer as it is. Uh, there's all kinds of problems that are going to be associated. And as I said. I don't think it's really understood all the mechanisms of the atmosphere, the upper atmosphere and the mixing of the chemicals and what these different introductions of different things can do. So uh, the modeling just isn't there, it's available. So it, you can't say that anything is benign until you really investigate it thoroughly, I think. Yeah. I think the people in uh, New Zealand are very concerned too. Same the kind of argument that you just said. And it goes against their um, uh, the government um, uh, policy of, of non-nuclear non policy. They don't want anything to do with nuclear weapons. And yet, if they're going to be part of a missile defense, uh, which some of the satellites they've sent up uh, are, uh, then that kind of goes against that policy. So the campaigners there are arguing against doing this kind of work in, in New Zealand too. Now, you talked about a launch facility, or three of them, I think you said, in Scotland, correct? Right. Uh, are there others in the UK, uh, other sites that are being considered for launch facilities as well? Yeah, there are. There's, uh, there's two different types of launch facility. There's the vertical rocket that we're all familiar with. But there's also the horizontal launch facility, which is... Um, means you strap a, 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 a kind of a missile, I guess, to an to a, a airplane, send the airplane up really high, and then shoot the missile up from there. So it doesn't require the vertical takeoff kind of situation, and you need, but you need a big aircraft um, uh, to, 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 launch, to, to, to start the launch off. Uh, so a couple of those are being planned, one in Cornwall, uh, one in Wales, and another one in Scotland, apart from these three vertical launch sites in, in the upper highlands of, of Scotland, in the islands of Scotland. And who's, who is proposing these and for what purposes would these uh, various launches in the UK uh, be used? Well, it, this is a bit of a giveaway because the UK government has paid uh, Lockheed Martin to, to help them kind of find some of these sites to, to give some advice on how they might put these some of these sites into operation. And one of the sites in the uh, upper Scottish islands is going to be used by Lockheed Martin. So um, it's very unlikely that you'll get anything other than military kind of work there. I think it's unlikely you'll get much other than military work in all the others either. That's exactly what happened in New Zealand uh, at Rocket Lab. Uh, they were told <clears throat> Rocket Lab was built on indigenous lands. They went to the indigenous community uh, that the developers, they promised that it would be for civilian use only. And then Lockheed Martin came in. They now run the place right. and are doing all these U.S. warfighting satellite launches. So it's the same story over and over again. Uh, so it, on the one hand, you've got all these 5G satellites being launched, crowding the orbits. But on the other hand, uh, you've got the military, U U.S. military, using facilities around the world, right, to launch military uh, missions. Mm -hmm. So the stress, if you will, on space, especially in lower Earth orbit, right, uh, is enormous now, isn't it? Absolutely. And, of course, the military also buy a lot of the services from commercial companies anyway, like photo reconnaissance and all that kind of stuff, and even some uh, other kinds of surveillance, I think. So 
you can't, you know, that's another thing that needs to be made clear. What are these things actually being used for? Sometimes we don't even know. Sometimes the companies themselves don't know. They just sell it, sell their product to uh, somebody else, and it turns out that it's the military in the end. That's why they call it dual use, right? Right, yeah. I remember when we had our global network meeting up in uh, Karuna, Sweden, uh, we had a, a visit to a, how would we describe this place? A downlink station that was uh, receiving satellite images and uh, processing them. And they finally, under some questioning, admitted that they were selling the pictures, I guess, and the other information, uh, the reconnaissance information, surveillance information, you could say, to the United States military. And a lot of it, they were taking pictures of Russia, right? So that's right. that, that's the way it works, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. You know, we went in there, they were claiming it was all civilian, you know? Oh yeah, you know, but it doesn't turn out to be the case. No. And I think the military are using these 5G systems too, aren't they? They're kind of uh, devastate the uh, underwater environment apart from anything else with these 5G systems now. It's, um, just amazing how much do we allow the military to get away with these things, really. Yeah, and those undersea uses of 5G are going to dramatically impact sea life, uh, particularly whales, dolphins, uh, other uh, other sea life uh, with these, uh, how, do you, how would we say, radio waves that will uh, affect their uh, their, their uh, their their physical uh, in case of mammals their their brains I I guess uh, we could yeah see. Their communication systems and everything yeah orientation systems yeah they're affected by all these microwave radiation yeah I mean we don't know the effects really of the microwave radiation on humans um, we could, we could be uh, subjecting humans to all, all kinds of problems that we don't know about yet. So space is really an unknown uh, quantity for most of us, uh, but it's sold as exciting and futuristic and adventurous. And we have to try to cut through all that in order to get people to pay attention to, to some of the severe implications. Let me stop there uh, and say we've got about two minutes left. Dave, if you want to just make some closing comments of any kind, please do. Well, thanks very much for um, putting this issue out. I mean, I think when I was young, I would also saw some space. I still do see space as kind of exciting. There's a lot of scientific advances being made through space um, studies and so on. Uh, the thing is, we've got to separate that from the other stuff, which is going to cause a lot of problems for us in the future and are causing a lot of problems for us now. And I think it's really time to assess properly and accurately what the effects of space launches and satellites are on the environment. It's a real, there's a real need to take these activities seriously and to go on with caution and not reckless abandon as it is at the moment. So uh, we should have learned by now how our unthinking actions have polluted the planet, filling the land and the oceans with plastic, changing the climate and even possibly destroying life so we must be far more careful well thank you dave it's a pleasure having you this is dr dave webb from leeds england he's the uh, board convener of the global network against weapons and nuclear power in space he also uh, runs our website at, which is at spaceforpeace.org he does a great job he's just uh, in the last uh, year I've done a whole retrofit of the website. It's really wonderful. Please check it out. And in the menu, you'll find the resource section. And we have space videos that are produced by Will Griffin, who's running this tech for us today on this uh, on this uh, show. Uh, and so Will makes a video every month for the Global Network, and they post them there. So please check those out. You'll learn a lot. Share them with others. This is the way we get other people to begin to learn about and care about uh, preventing an arms race in space and the environmental destruction, devastation of space as well. 
So thanks for watching this edition of Space Alert. Next month, we'll do another show with another leader from, the, uh, from around the world working with the Global Network. Until then, good luck to you all, and please get organized. Bye-bye.